Welcome to lecture 4.5, the isomorphism theorems. The fundamental homomorphism theorem that we saw two lectures ago is actually the first of four basic theorems in group theory about homomorphisms and their structure. These are commonly called the isomorphism theorems, and they're listed below. As I just said, the first isomorphism theorem is what we called the fundamental homomorphism theorem. The second isomorphism theorem is sometimes called the diamond isomorphism theorem. The third isomorphism theorem is sometimes called the freshman theorem. And the fourth isomorphism theorem is sometimes called the correspondence theorem or the lattice isomorphism theorem. Now all of these theorems have analogs in other algebraic structures such as rings, vector spaces, modules, and Lie algebras, just to name a few. In this lecture, we will summarize the last three isomorphism theorems and provide visual pictures for each. We will prove one of them, I think the third isomorphism theorem. We will outline the proofs of another, namely the second isomorphism theorem, and we will encourage you to try the very straightforward proofs of the multiple parts of the last isomorphism theorem. When we are done with the isomorphism theorems, we will introduce the concepts of a commutator and of a commutator subgroup whose quotient yields something called the abelianization of a group. It's some way to divide out by all of the non-abelian parts. We will conclude with some examples and in particular a few that directly utilize the fourth isomorphism theorem. As an Without further ado, here is the second isomorphism theorem also called the diamond isomorphism theorem for reasons that we will see very shortly. Suppose H is a subgroup of G and N is a normal subgroup of G. Then the first part says that the product HN that's defined as the set of all products of the form something in H times something in N is a subgroup of G. Secondly, the intersection of H and N is a normal subgroup of G. And finally, the following quotient groups are isomorphic. HN mod N and H mod H intersect N. And a picture of this is shown on the right, and this should make it clear why it's called the diamond isomorphism theorem. So we have a group G, and we have two subgroups H and N. We know N is normal in G. We don't know anything about H. Then this product, HN, that is all products of things in H with things in N, that is a subgroup of G. It might be all of G. It doesn't have to be. It clearly contains both H and N. And to see why, well, you can get H from taking the product of things in H with the identity in N, and you can get N by taking the product of the identity in H with things in N. Also clear is that the intersection, H intersect N, is contained in both H and contained in N. Okay, so now I will sketch the proof of this theorem. Actually, I'll just sketch the proof of this third part involving the isomorphism, because that's going to actually use the fundamental homomorphism theorem. Before I do that, let me say a few words about the proofs of these first two parts. I'll start with the first one. Why is this product, in other words, this set here, a subgroup of G? Well, to prove that, we need to verify the three properties of being a group. First of all, that it contains the identity, and I claim that's easy. Well, the identity is in H, and the identity is in N, so it's clearly in this set because I can write it as the identity times the identity. Okay, that's done. Next, closure. Why is the product of two elements of this form necessarily of that form? Well, let's see. Let me take an element of that form. Let me say H1, N1, and let me multiply it by another element of that form. So times 
H2 times N2. Why is this element of this form? Why can I write this as something in H times something in N? It certainly doesn't look like I can, right? Because it's something in H times something in N times something in H times something in N. Well, this is going to strongly depend on the fact that N is normal. And it's not obvious of how to proceed. So here's a sneaky little trick that I'm going to do. It's not hard, but it's probably not the first thing you would think of. So I'm going to st stick between this first H and first N a copy of the identity element. You can't stop me from doing that. But I'm not going to just write it as E. I'm going to write it in a clever way. I'm going to write it as H2 times H2 inverse. And let's see why that works. Well, now I have H1, H2, H2 inverse times N1 times H2 times N2. So it looks like I've made things more complicated. Now it's the product of a bunch of things in H times something in N times something in H times something in N. But look at this. I'm going to put parentheses around here like this. And what can we say? N is a normal subgroup. That means that this product here, the conjugate of something in N, has to remain in N. In other words, this this product of three elements is in N. And now what? Now I have something in N times N2. That is certainly in N. So this is in N. And look what's up front. H1 times H2, that is certainly in H. So this is in H. So now you have to agree that this element here, H1, N1, H2, N2, I have written explicitly as the product of something in H, namely H1, H2, times something in N, namely H2 inverse, N1, H2, N2. So that's how you show closure. Finally, what about inverses? So let's go down here and check that. Um, so let's take an element in there, H times N. So what is the inverse of this? Well, the inverse is clearly N inverse H inverse, right? That's the identity. So why is this inverse, why is this element in this set here? It's not clear that I can write this inverse as something in H times something in N. We do a similar trick, N inverse times H inverse. Well, so what do we do? Can we multiply this by the identity on the left and write it so it ends up in this form, something in H times something in N? Let's try that. So let's, let's stick an H right here. Oops, stick an H right there, and then an H inverse right there. And now as before, notice that this thing here is the conjugate of something in N. Therefore, this is in N, and clearly this, this part is in H. So this is the inverse of Hn, and it is certainly the product of something in H and the product of something in N, namely H inverse times Hn inverse H inverse. So this also needed the fact that N was normal. So th this is a crucial assumption in this isomorphism theorem. Okay, so that's... That's how you prove that the product is a subgroup. 
I will let you write this out formally if you want to. In other words, just practice to write it in a, as a formal proof. Uh, next, why is the intersection of H and N a normal subgroup of G? There's nothing tricky here. This is a lot easier. It's just checking those three properties. It contains the identity. It's closed and inverses exist. You don't need to do any sneaky little trick like multiplying by acute form of the identity in the middle of the word. Okay, so now let's get to the third part. Why are these following quotient groups isomorphic? So what we will do is we will apply the first isomorphism theorem and we will define a map from this group H as the domain to Hn mod n. And if we can show that H intersect n is the kernel, and this is a homomorphism, and it's onto, then by the first isomorphism theorem, H mod the kernel of phi will be isomorphic to the image, which we hope is Hn mod n. And if we can show the kernel is this intersection, and this map, again, is a homomorphism, and it's onto, then we're done. Okay, so how do we want to define this map? So it clearly takes something in H. Where does it map it to? Well, first of all, what do things in here look like? What is this set? This is a set of cosets of N. Let's go at our, over to our diamond picture. N is a subgroup. So we have cosets of N in G, but we also have cosets of N in this potentially smaller group, HN. So what's a natural coset of N in this group involving H? Well, there's not many things we can choose. We only have this single element to work with. So let's just map it to the coset little h times n, like this. OK, so what do we do now? If we can show that phi is a homomorphism, that phi is onto, and that the kernel of phi is the intersection of h and n, that's this set here, then the result will follow immediately from the fundamental homomorphism theorem. The details of this are left as a homework exercise. Everything here is straightforward. There's no little tricks like there were in showing that this product is a subgroup. So I wish you luck. Give it a shot. Next, we come to the third isomorphism theorem, also called the Freshman Theorem. Before I state it, I want to say a few words about this first assumption. So we have a chain of normal subgroups of G. Now, I have not written these using the normal subgroup symbol, a triangle. In other words, I have not made this a triangle and made that a triangle. I could, but I want to emphasize that this is still not quite the condition that I'm saying. So H, of course, is a normal subgroup in G. We can agree that we can put a line here and make this a triangle. H is normal in G. But we're saying not that N is normal in H, but N is also normal in G. And that's a stronger condition. So if N is normal in G, if everything in G normalizes N, fixes it by conjugation, well then clearly everything in H does too, because we only have fewer things to choose from in H than we do in G. However, the converse is not necessarily true. In other words, normality is not a transitive property. If N is normal in H and H is normal in G, that does not imply that N is normal in G. And on the homework, I will ask you to find a counterexample of that to show why that doesn't necessarily hold. However, because N is normal in G, N is definitely normal in H. Okay, so you got that? Now let's state the theorem. First, 
the quotient h mod n is a normal subgroup of g mod n. Notice that n is the smallest subgroup of these three, and it is normal in both h and in g, so we can quotient out by it. In other words, we have the following chain of subgroups, n mod n, which is trivial, is a subgroup of h mod n, which is a subgroup of g mod n. Think about what these things are. So this is a set of cosets of n in g. This is the subset of those cosets that also lie in h. And this is just the identity coset, n itself. Secondly, the following quotients are isomorphic. g mod n mod h mod n is isomorphic to g mod h. In other words, if we write it like this, g mod n mod h mod n, you would do exactly what you wanted to. If, you were, if these were fractions or numbers, you would just cancel the n's and you would say that's g mod h. This is what you want to happen, but as we've seen in group theory, things don't behave exactly as they would if they were plain old numbers. So for one, we need an isom isomorphism symbol here. And this is the motivation for calling this the freshman theorem. A, a freshman in high school or a freshman even in college who doesn't know anybody who sees this is going to say, oh, of course you can cancel the n here and the can cancel the n there and get g mod h. Well, it's actually a very non-trivial fact that you can do this. Here is a picture, or sort of a cartoon, of the third isomorphism theorem that my friend Zach Teitler of Boise State made. So here's the group G. In G is a subgroup H, this orange subgroup, and within that is this subgroup N. And within N are the, all these elements. I don't know if N is finite or infinite, it doesn't matter. As I said, this is more of a cartoon. So G mod N is the group of cosets of N in G. So these six green squares. And some of these green squares, namely two of them, are also contained in H. So H mod N is the group of cosets of N in H. So just these two. So if you look at G mod N mod H mod N, so that is the group of these six green squares modded out by these two green squares, and then what you get are these three right here. So G mod N mod H mod N is isomorphic to G mod H. Now this picture isn't perfect, but it hopefully should help motivate the idea behind this. And I would encourage you to pause this lecture and Stare at this for another minute or two and think about it on your own. It's the sort of thing that you have to convince yourself of on your own time, not on my time. Okay, so let's prove the third isomorphism theorem. Let me restate it a little more succinctly first. If we have a chain of normal subgroups of G, then H mod N is normal in G mod N, and this quotient is isomorphic to G mod H. It's easy to show that H mod N is normal in G mod N. And I'll leave this as an exercise. Although I'll sketch it right now. Well, let's take something in here, an element, which is a coset. So that's going to be H N. And let's conjugate it by something in here, something in G mod N. So that's going to be G N on the right and G inverse N on the left. So we want to conjugate this and show that it remains in H mod N. That's what it means to be normal. So this product of three cosets by definition is G H G inverse N. And what do we know about this? Well H is normal in G and therefore, this remains in H. 
So in other words, this is in H, and therefore this left coset is in H mod N. This is a left coset of N that is in H because the representative is in H. Okay, so I said an exercise, but I actually did it for you. Now, we wanted to find a map from G mod N, that's this group right here on the left, to G mod H. And if we can define a map, that's a homomorphism that is onto and whose kernel is H mod N, then we're done by the first isomorphism theorem, or the fundamental homomorphism theorem. So how do we define this map? Let's see, it's going from cosets of N to cosets of H. So here's a coset of N, GN, and there's not many natural cosets of H we can write down because we don't have much to work with. So what do you think we need to put here? How about this? GH. So we're sending GN to GH. And remember that N sits inside H, which sits inside G. First, we need to show that this is well-defined because our domain consists of cosets. So it's possible that this map might depend on which representative we choose, and that can't be the case. So let's suppose that we have two different representatives for the same coset, G1 and G2. So like I select G1N and you select G2N. Well then our map, as defined here, better send these things to the same element. In other words, the same coset of H. Well, if these are the same coset, that just means that G1 is equal to G2 times N for some element in N, right? Because G1 is in this coset, so we can write it as G2 times something in N. However, little n, the element, is in H because big N, the subgroup, is contained in big H. So what does this tell us? Well, let's write it down. G1H, remember we're trying to show this is equal to G2H. So G1H is G2 little n times H. And now what? Well, I'm going to put parentheses around the NH and say, well, since this little n is an element in H, this coset is just H, the subgroup. So this is equal to G2H. And that's what we were trying to show. This G1H, this is phi of G1N, and G2H is phi of G2N. So let's write this up formally. So because a little n is in H, that means that G1H equals G2H, i.e. phi of G1N equals phi of G2N. So our map is well defined. Next, I claim that phi is clearly onto and a homomorphism. And let's check these. So why is it onto? So let's take an arbitrary element in the codomain, G mod H. So that's going to be a coset of H and G. Let's say it's little g times H. Why does that have a preimage? Well, just take the same representative G and stick it in front of N, and clearly, phi maps that coset of N to that coset of G. So phi is clearly onto. Why is it a homomorphism? This is one of those ones where you just follow your nose. Phi of G1 N, G2 N. Well, by definition, the product of these two cosets is just g1 g2n so phi of this element by definition of phi up here is just g1 g2h right and now you can't stop me from writing this as g1h g2h and this is phi of G1N, and this is phi of G2N. So this is phi of G1N times phi 
of G2N. So that's why phi is a homomorphism. Finally, we want to apply the fundamental homomorphism theorem. As I said before, if we have a map from G mod N to G mod H, that's onto and a homomorphism, and the kernel is H mod N, then we're done. So let's show that the kernel of this map is indeed H mod N. So the kernel of this map, kernel of phi, is everything that in G mod N that gets mapped to the identity coset in G mod H. So it's all cosets, little g n, that map get mapped to H by phi. Using the definition of phi, this is all cosets g n such that g h, that's what phi of g n is, equals H. So when does g h equal H? Well, that's precisely when little g is in H. So the kernel is a set of all cosets g n such that g is in H. In other words, it is the set of all cosets of n in H, where this representative is in H, which is precisely the set H mod n. And that's what we wanted. So, by the fundamental homomorphism theorem, g mod n mod the kernel, well, that's g mod n mod h mod n, because the kernel of phi is equal to h mod n. That is isomorphic to the image of phi, which is g mod h, because phi is onto. And that concludes the proof. Finally, we come to the fourth isomorphism theorem. The full statement of this is a bit technical, and there are five parts. So here we will just state it informally, and then we'll do some examples. In the next slide, I will state it formally in its full detail. So the correspondence theorem, also called the lattice isomorphism theorem, says if we have a normal subgroup of G, then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between subgroups of the quotient and subgroups of G that contain N. In particular, every subgroup of the quotient, G mod N, has the form A mod N, we call that A bar, for some A, for some subgroup A that lies between N and G. What this is really saying is the corresponding subgroup lattices are identical in structure. So I think we need an example to make sense of this. For our example, we will let G be the group Q4 and the normal subgroup N be the subgroup generated by negative 1. So the correspondence theorem says there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between, let's do this one first, subgroups of G that contain N. So there are five of them here. These are highlighted in blue. So there's G and there's N and then there's three intermediate subgroups, those generated by I, by J, and by K, respectively. So there's a correspondence between those five and between the subgroups of the quotient G mod N. So here's the quotient, Q4 mod negative one, and that has five subgroups, itself, the identity, and then these three intermediate subgroups, which are the quotient of these subgroups of Q4 that contain N by negative one. So this is what I mean when I say the corresponding subgroup lattices are identical in structure. Look at this subgroup lattice, Starting from N going up to G, that is identical to the lattice of the quotient, and both of those are, of course, isomorphic to the lattice of the group V4, because Q mod this subgroup N is isomorphic to V4. Now, as promised, I will show the full intimidating version of the correspondence theorem. So let's let N be a subgroup of G. So I said there is a bijection from the subgroups of G mod N. 
and the subgroups of G that contain N. In particular, every subgroup of the quotient has the form A bar, which is short for A mod N, for some intermediate subgroup A that lies between N and G. So that was on their previous slide. Here's the new part. And I can summarize this by saying everything you want to be true is true. For example, if A and B are subgroups of G, then A is a subgroup of B if and only if A bar is a subgroup of B bar. So in this picture down here, now I'm using a different set of subgroups. I'm looking at D4, and my normal subgroup is generated by R squared. So again, there are five subgroups of D4 that contain R squared, and the quotient is a has five subgroups as well. So these lattices look identical. You can picture the lattice of the quotient is formed by pinching the lattice of the regular group, the original group G, at the subgroup N and discarding everything below it. And then just modding out by N or R squared everywhere else. So as in the previous slide, this quotient is isomorphic to V4. And that's just a coincidence. But this first condition says A is a subgroup of B, so this thing is a subgroup of that if and only if A bar is a subgroup of B bar. So for example, these two subgroups generated by R and F and by R are not subgroups over here of each other, so they're not going to be subgroups of each other over here. Number two, if A is a subgroup of B, then the index of A and B is the same as the index of A bar and B bar. For example, the index of R in D4 is the same as the index of, of R mod R squared in D4 mod, uh, D4 mod R squared. So the indices of every one of these edges is the same. And a lot of other things, as you would expect, the subgroup generated by, so take two subgroups A and B, look at what generates them, maybe that's something up here, and then quotient out by that. That's the same thing as if you took those corresponding quotient subgroups over here and looked at what subgroup generates is generated by them. So nothing too surprising. I'll skip number four. I'll let you think about that. But that, that says almost the same thing, just with intersections instead of um, subgroup generation. And finally, a subgroup over here, these things are normal in G if and only if the corresponding quotient subgroups are normal in the quotient. So again, nothing too surprising. It's a bit technical to state this, but it really does say these lattices are identical, and it just gives further evidence for that, and everything you want to be true is true. For the last part of this lecture, we'll do an application of the correspondence theorem. We will look at what are called commutator subgroups and abelianizations of groups. And that's, that really is what you think it is. It's taking a non-abelian group and making it abelian. So we've seen how to divide the integer z by the subgroup generated by 12, and thereby we are forcing all multiples of 12 to be 0. So that was the kernel of a certain homomorphism. And this is one way to construct the integers modulo 12. Namely, z12 is isomorphic to z mod the subgroup generated by 12. Now, suppose g is not abelian. We would like to divide g by its so-called non-abelian parts, making them 0, making them the kernel of some homomorphism, and thereby leaving only abelian parts in the resulting quotient. A commutator, this is a definition, is an element in a group that can be written as A times B times A inverse times B inverse for some A and B. Let me say a few words about this. First of all, if A and B commute, then you can swap their order make this be A, 
then the A and the A inverse cancel, cancels, and the B and the B inverse cancels. So anytime A and V commutes, the corresponding commutator is the identity. But if G is a non-abelian group, then there are non-identity commutators. There are things like this that are not the identity. And if A and B don't commute, this cannot be the identity. So in the Cayley diagram, if A and B commutes, that just means we have red-blue equals blue-red, and we get this fragment that exists throughout the diagram. But if A and B don't commute, then we have red-blue, red-inverse, blue-inverse, that must end up somewhere else. In this case, the set, let's call it C for commutator, the set of all commutators, set of all of these, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, where A and B range throughout G, contains more than the identity element if G is non-abelian. So let's define the commutator subgroup G prime is the notation for it of G to be the subgroup generated by all of these things. So the subgroup generated by all the commutators. It turns out that this is a normal subgroup of G. It's not obvious, but it will be a homework exercise. And if we quotient out by this subgroup, we get an abelian group. And why is that? Well, in terms of the Cayley diagram, it's because we have killed every instance of this fragment. We have our, our commutator subgroup C is going to contain this fragment and possibly other things. And so when we shrink it down to a point or a vertex, all of these non-abelian fragments go away. Algebraically, we have put every one of these commutators inside the kernel. And so we're essentially declaring every commutator to be the identity, just like how we're declaring up here all multiples of 12 to be the identity, or to be 0. So if we quotient out by the commutator subgroup, we get an abelian group. And that is called the abelianization of G. It's the quotient of G by the commutator subgroup. This is the group that one gets by literally killing off all non-abelian parts of G. In some sense, the commutator subgroup G prime is the smallest normal subgroup N of G, such that N mod G is abelian. And I say the smallest because there are potentially bigger groups that would work. For example, you could always just quotient by the whole group G. That would clearly be the largest normal subgroup whose quotient is abelian. But then there might be other smaller groups, and G prime is in fact the smallest. Equivalently, the quotient G mod G prime is the largest abelian quotient of G. So instead of thinking of the smallest normal subgroup for which the quotient is abelian, you can look at the quotient and say, what is the largest thing you can get that's abelian? That's a quotient of G. And again, if you quotient out by G, you get the identity. That would be the smallest such abelian quotient. So here's how you would formalize such a statement of smallest and largest, because it's not clear that there necessarily should be one or that there should be a unique one. You know, there, there might be two minimal such normal subgroups, but not a unique one. So let's suppose F is a homomorphism from G to some abelian group. And we know there's at least one, because there's always a homomorphism from G to the identity group. Right? You just quotient out by everything, like we do here. Well, if we have such a homomorphism, then there is always a unique homomorphism from the abelianization to that same group, such that our original homomorphism can be done by first 
doing the quotient and then doing this unique homomorphism. Now that may seem a little bit weird, but here's the diagram that hopefully should clear this up a little bit. So if we have a group G and any quotient to a fixed abelian group A, then what we could do is we could first quotient out by the commutator to get an abelian quotient, and then there's a unique homomorphism that completes it. And you can think of it like this. Think of it in terms of Cayley diagrams. So you are taking your big Cayley diagram G, and you are quotienting out by a whole bunch of stuff, by, or you're quotienting out by enough stuff that you're killing off all the non-abelian parts, and the resulting quotient is abelian. Well, then what you could have done instead of this is you could have just quotient out by the minimal non-abelian things, just the commutator subgroup. So no overkill, just quotient out by as little as you have to, and you get this intermediate group, which is abelian, but it's not fully collapsed as much as it would be if you had just quotient out to A originally. So you can, so instead of this big collapsing down to an abelian group, you can first collapse minimally by quotienting out the commutator subgroup, and then you can complete this collapsing uniquely by collapsing everything that you didn't collapse. And we say that this homomorphism, F, factors through the abelianization. So I'm not going to prove this, but I just wanted to show it to you and, and make the connection between what it means for a homomorphism to factor through to the picture of, or at least the mental picture I want you to have in terms of Cayley diagrams. And I, I might put something like this on the homework of proving that this homomorphism, this homomorphism does exist. Actually, I think I probably will. We will finish with two examples. So let's consider the groups A4, the alternating group, with n equals 4, and D4, the dihedral group, with n equals 4. It is easy to check that the commutator of A4, remember there's only 12 elements in this group, so it's all elements like this, it's isomorphic to V4. And that the commutator subgroup of D4, again, all elements of this form, and there's only eight things you can choose from in D4, is a subgroup generated by R squared. I'll let you verify that if you want to, but that's not too hard to check. Here are the subgroup lattices of A4 and of D4. I know we've seen this one before. I'm not sure we've seen the subgroup lattice of A4, but here are the four subgroups of order 3. Here's the one of order 4, which is isomorphic to V4, and here are the three of order 2. And also I've highlighted in red the commutator subgroups. For A4 it's this one of order 4, and for D4 it's the subgroup generated by R2. By the correspondence theorem, the abelianization of A4 is the quotient of A4 with this. And so the, the quotient has a subgroup lattice that looks like this. It says index 3. So in other words, the quotient must be a subgroup of order 3. And there's only one of them, up to isomorphism, at C3. Similarly, the quotient of D4 with subgroup generated by R squared, that's going to be isomorphic to V4, the Klein 4 group, because we know what its subgroup lattice looks like by the correspondence theorem. It looks just like this, the lattice for the group V4. Notice that G mod G prime is abelian. And also, notice that the quotient of G by anything above G prime will yield an abelian group. So let's go over to D4. I said this is the smallest subgroup whose quotient is abelian. Indeed, if I take anything below that, here I got a quotient that is not abelian. But if I take anything above this, let's take this group and take D4 mod this, we also get something that's abelian. 
So if we quotient by anything above this commutator subgroup, we automatically get an abelian quotient. So sometimes, not knowing anything about this, it, this group D4, suppose you don't want to compute this commutator, because writing out x, y, x inverse, y inverse for all pairs of elements in D4, even though there's eight elements, there's eight choose two pairs, that can be kind of cumbersome. You can actually figure out the commutator subgroup of D4 just by inspection, just by looking at the lattice. Say, what group do you quotient, what subgroup of D4 is the smallest one that you quotient out by to get something abelian? Now, there only are a few ab normal subgroups of D4. There's the there's subgroup generated by R and subgroup generated by R squared and the identity and, of course, itself. Those are the only normal subgroups. And so you can just check those one by one and see which one of those gives you a quotient, in other words, gives you the lattice of an abelian group. Take the largest one of those, and that is your commutator subgroup. The same trick works over here.